Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. I began looking for a teaching job after taking a few years off teaching full-time. I just thought if I can just find a job, um, I was interviewing for every job possible. All summer long I was interviewing. Um, I would be in a pool of 15 and I would make it down to the final two five times it happened and then I came in second all five times. Um, I just didn't understand. I got to be in a really dark place. There were days it was hard to get out of bed. It was hard to make it through the day. I didn't know what was going to happen to our with our family. I felt like God wasn't answering my prayers. Um, it was really, really difficult time. And then school started and I didn't have a job. And I thought, well, that's it. You know, what I'm, what, you know, I just, it was really bad at that point. Um, that's when I finally realized what I'm trying is not working. I'm trying to control the situation on my own. I'm not relying in my faith in God to take care of a situation. He has a plan for me. I don't understand the plan. I don't understand why it's taking so long when I wanted a quick answer. Um, but He has a plan, and I'm part of His plan, and I have to trust Him and, tr and have faith in Him. So after I finally came to that realization, two, um, two weeks after school started, I got a call, and they were opening a new section of pre-K in the district where I wanted to work. Because so many children had not pre-registered, they had to open a new class, and that never happens. I've now taught for this district eight years. That's never happened again. It was a miracle, and I was at the point where I needed a miracle. There was nothing I could do on my own. I needed a miracle, and I got it. If I had taught some of the jobs where I was interviewing that I wanted so badly at the time, I thought it was the perfect solution, it would not have been best for our family. And God knew, and He had the perfect place for me, but it was His timing, not mine. And He taught me a lot of patience, and my faith grew so much during that time. Um, and now I know that it's in faith alone, that's what it takes, um, just trusting in Him. Am I going to be okay? Really? And with all that's happening in our world today, I think that it's a valid question. Am I going to be okay? Or how can I be okay? I talk to people all the time. And behind many questions and challenges in our lives, I think it's that one. And it's actually the oldest question known to man, I think, in many ways. In fact, in the book of Job, you can see it there. Job chapter 25, verse 4. Job, which is the oldest book in the Bible, by the way. Now, obviously, it doesn't precede Genesis, but the writing of the book is prior to anything else in Scripture. And Job asked this question, how then can man be in the right before God? How can he, who is born of a woman, be pure? This is another way of saying, how can I be righteous before the Lord? How can I be justified? You hear that word. How can I be right? How can anyone who's ever been born be pure, he says, before a holy God? Now, you may be, you may be thinking, well, yeah, no, that sounds like not everybody's asking that question. Not everybody's asking, how can I be righteous before God? That sounds like a preacher question. That's, a, that's like a Bible question. But at the heart of it is that sense, a simple way to say that. Am I, am I, am I going to be okay? And... If there's a God, am I, co am I okay before Him? How can I be justified? How can I be pure? How can I be okay? And the surprising answer that frustrates the modern mind is there is one way to be okay. And it's by faith alone. Now we're going to unpack that because that that means a lot of things. So today, Justin welcomed all the kids. I'm going to ask the kids, put on your thinking cap. 
and I'm going to ask all the adults to put on your thinking cap. We don't check our brains in at the door when we come in here. We're going to think about some heavy theology today, frankly, and we're going to dive into this thing that is faith alone. This doctrine, gang, listen, separates the gospel that we see in the Bible apart from every other gospel that comes down the pike, from every other religion on the planet. And so we're walking through these five solas as we celebrate the 500th year of the uh, Reformation. Uh, and we're celebrating this month on the 31st, of course, is the 500th uh, to the day when Martin Luther nailed his theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church. We've been talking about that along the way. Today we find ourselves, you can see it there, faith alone. Next week we're looking at Christ alone and then to the glory of God alone. So you can see that grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, all three, all five of these go together because apart from scripture alone, we know nothing of this really. And then it's all to the glory of God alone. So let's talk about it. Turn to Romans chapter three. All right. Grab your Bible or whatever you may have there in front of you. Grab your Bible. Turn to Romans three. The big question the reformers came to was this. Are we justified by faith alone or is it faith and something else? Is it faith and some mixture of works? Is it faith plus what the church tells us, the Roman Catholic church at the time, the really the universal church in essence? Um, is it what the Pope says, what papal authorities tell us? Is it that I must keep the sacraments of the church? I can come to him by faith, uh, but then I, do, I, do I continue in Catholic theology what's called congruous merit, where I'm adding to the mix, it's faith and works? Or is it by faith alone? So if last week it was grace up against the law, we're going to see some of that today. Today it's faith up against works. So last week, before we get to Romans 3, last week we looked at this passage in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You can see it there. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that seems to answer the question pretty quick. And it's not your own doing. This is not your own doing. It's a gift from God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. Now hang on to that phrase. We just sang it, didn't we? For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared uh, beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul is addressing the same question. How can a person be justified? How can I be okay before a holy God? That's the question he's answering here in Romans, really throughout the New Testament. We see it in Ephesians. I mean, we see it in Galatians. And it was the question that the uh, reformers were wrestling with. And this was the heart of the matter. Is it faith alone or must I add to because the church had gotten off course and through indulgences, paying penance, the sacraments, all that was laid upon the people, there was this works-based salvation, a self-salvation, self-justification project that had become what we called Christianity. We got way off track. So today I want to answer this question because here's what happens. Every time we enter this quest thinking, can I be okay? It always leads us to, to the law. It always leads to works and it would logically, wouldn't it? How can I be okay? Well, what, what can I do to be okay? I, I've got to do some things to be okay, right? This quest always leads us to our own self-justification our own righteousness. Maybe if I'm good enough, I'll be okay. We all do that. And that's a logical path to take. Every religion on the planet says, do this, do that, then you'll be okay. Only in Christianity do you find something else. And Paul starts Romans 3, verse 21. Look at verse 21. We'll see it on the screen. But now. Gang, I cannot underestimate... The power of those two words. But now, there has never been anything like this. Where we're somehow, watch this, we're going to be justified by faith, not by our own works. And Paul says, but now, the righteousness of God, we're going to define some terms here, has been manifest, has been made known apart from the law. Although the law and prophets... They bear witness to it. They pointed to this, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified, there's that word, by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. 
Let's talk about faith alone. I'm going to use this language. If you take notes, you can write these down. Just a few of them here. Faith alone. I'm going to say apart from. So it's faith apart from. All right? Because this is the language he uses here. It's apart from. It's apart from works of the law. It's apart from the law. So first, I want you to see, but now, as never before, faith apart from any credit, we see here, he says, the righteousness of God. Now, let's define this for a moment. God's own perfection. You can see it on the screen there. Righteousness of God. God's own perfection in every attribute, every attitude, behavior, every word. It's his holiness. It's his perfection. That is the righteousness of God. He's eternal. He's infinite. You know, I think a lot of us, our problem is not what Bonhoeffer called cheap grace, that, that it's just, well, I receive, I believe, so I can just live like I want to. It's grace, all grace. For many of us, the problem is what I'd call cheap law, which means, no, we've lowered the standard and we've forgotten how perfect and holy he is. We say, well, I know God's better than me. I mean, he's really good. No, no, no. He's infinitely good. Well, and he's loving. I mean, I'm not always loving, but he really is. No, no, no. He's infinitely loving. Well, he's smarter than I am. I'll give him that. (laughs) He's omniscient. There's nothing he doesn't know. He is perfect in every way. That's the righteousness of God. And to stand before God like that, we too must be perfect. The righteousness of God is that we now must come before him. And, and, and it says it's apart from the law. Look at this. The law, the totality of God's holy demands placed on humans, human beings to be justified before him. You say, well, why is it set up that way? Well, it's because he's holy. He's perfect. It, this is a way of referring to, the, to how God would have us live in every single area of our life. Everything we say, everything we do. Now, the law, you can see that there too, capital L, refers to really the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, and and all the laws that we find there, the Ten Commandments among hundreds of laws that we, the people of God, were to keep in order to gain acceptance by him. That is, again, religion of works, righteousness apart from being good enough, is what Paul says, now it's come. It's a righteousness apart from being okay with our own efforts or through our own efforts. So it's faith apart from commands. You see that? Faith apart from commands. And then look at this next one. Faith apart from culture. If it's, if it's faith apart from commands, it's now faith apart from culture. He says that, that this righteousness is found not in a people, but in a person, in a promise. And the promise is a person and his name is Jesus. He says the law and prophets, he in essence pointed to this, Okay, so there was a promise to come, but many people think still, and maybe you, you know, you're, you're still sorting through this, uh, what you believe. Uh, I talk to people often. It's, you know, well, I guess I'm a believer. I'm, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm a Christian. I'm not Hindu. I'm not Muslim. I'm American. And so I must be a Christian. And this plays further than you know. People think, well, we're a Christian nation, right? So I'm a Christian. And they've never made a decision to trust Christ for their salvation. And they're continuing on in this self-justification, self-salvation project. And what Paul is saying is here, it's not based on any group. We're not Christians because we're Americans. We're not Christians because we're Baptists or Protestants or because we grew up in UP or Lake Highlands or Richardson or grew up in North Dallas or wherever we grew up in America. It's not... A people, it's not a culture. It extends all cultures across all the world. There's no distinction, he says, because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. So it's faith apart from commandments, faith apart from culture. It's faith apart from concession. Here's what I mean. God does not concede his holiness. He doesn't step down from his perfection. He doesn't lower his standard of holiness. We're in a mess. His standard is still perfection. His standard, there's no curve. There's no, he's not grading by curve. And this this truth terrified Martin Luther. And I think many of us, we we don't have this kind of mindset. He he realized God's not lowering his standard. And the concept of the righteousness of God terrified him because he knew that he was a sinner. 
And he knew that he was depraved to the core, and there was nothing he could bring to the table. They asked Martin Luther, what do we contribute to our salvation? He said, sin and resistance. That's what we bring. It's why I've often said, the the only thing that we bring to our salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. That's all we bring. And friends, this is at once the most terrifying news that you will ever come to in your life. And it's the most liberating gospel known to man. But now, there's a righteousness that has come to us apart from the law. Notice that he uses this word sinned. All have sinned. What is sin? Well, sin is missing the mark. It's not simply good or bad behavior. This is important to understand. It's a condition of the heart. We, we need to really grasp this. Let's unpack this for a minute because this is critical to our understanding. What makes you a Christian is not that, listen, not that you, okay, Christ died on the cross. So what makes you a Christian is not, well, I repent of my sins and now he can forgive me. And I'm glad I've got that going. I'm forgiven. I can now get better, work harder. Oh, I sin again. I repent. I come back to the well and and he forgives me again. I I try better, work harder. I'm a little better. Oop, sin. I repent, come back. And, And most of us live like this. Listen, the Pharisees live like that. The Pharisees, who were very concerned about their sin, by the way, they would constantly come back, repent, seek forgiveness, try to work harder, get better. Fail, sin, seek repentance. They, that's how they lived. They were legalistic, self-justifying moralists. They were not Christians, and they lived that way. And many of us in this room right now live that way. And it's why for you, it's it's where you you don't find God as loving and accepting. You find him as as this taskmaster. And it's hard for you to pray. It's hard for you to come to sing to him. Because you're not certain that he is loving. Here's the thing, gang. Christianity is not a shift, listen, from vice to virtue. Christianity is a shift from virtue to to Christ's righteousness. Are you tracking with me? Let me say it this way. Christianity is not the move from bad works to good works. It's a move from God or good works to Christ's righteousness. Now let me just, let's let's get underneath this. This is big time. It's a move from seeking to justify yourself to allowing Christ alone to justify you. It's faith alone In him alone. It's why way back in Isaiah 64 verse 6. Maybe you've seen this verse before. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf. And like the wind our sins sweep us away. Do you get this? Listen. The the old King James says all of our righteousnesses. Every righteous deed, like filthy rags. Our righteousness, never mind our sins, are filthy rags before God. So many people believe that, you know, being a Christian means that, well, again, Christ died on the cross, I fail, I come back to him, I keep on coming back. But how do you break this cycle? Because I got a hunch a lot of us fall into this trap. How do you break the cycle. And I want to challenge you with some different thinking here. Stop looking at your sin and start looking at your boasting. And here's what I mean. Now, yes, look at your sin. (laughs) Name it. Confess your sin. Repent of your sin. Praise God for the grace that's already been extended to you in Christ. If you have received his grace, you're forgiven already. But I would say it this way. Stop looking at your sin and look at your boasting. Remember earlier we looked at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And if we're saved by grace through faith alone, we cannot boast. And Paul points to a diagnostic question in Romans 3, 27. You can see it on the screen. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By the law of works? No, but by the law of faith. He's saying, now, if there's the law of works that we're living under, then you can kind of boast, right? I bring a little bit, 
Maybe not enough, but I'm trying hard. I bring a little bit to the table, and so I can boast. Now, a lot of us, you're like me. You're thinking, Jeff, I don't boast. I mean, I'm not that arrogant. I don't, I don't boast about my good works. I'm not boasting. We all boast. In other words, where do we find our self-justification? Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 6.14. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. He's saying, I, if I'm going to boast in anything, I'm boasting in Christ. Let me, let me ask you, do you boast in Christ? Do you boast in him alone? As we sang about earlier, in what or in whom do you boast? This is worth, this is worth talking about. It's worth thinking about. I want you to have that question in your mind. We're seeking to, here it is. If you can track where you boast, whatever your boast is, that's how you seek to justify yourself. And it's self-justification that's keeping you from faith alone. And this is especially true in our context. And I mean, I mean, Christian North Dallas context. It's the great challenge that I have. It's the one that you have. My boasting points me to how I think I'm going to be okay. We do it in little ways, you know, post it on social media. I'm okay. Look at me. I'm okay. Look at this salad I'm eating. I'm okay. I'm going to be okay. Look at this great selfie of me. You know, you take 10 of them. Oh, finally, I'm going to be okay. I'm justifying myself. And you say, well, yeah, Jeff, not everybody lives that. Every person on the planet is seeking to justify themselves, to validate their existence. If you can't do that, you want to go jump off a bridge. If you can't justify your existence... Every one of us are doing it, and what happens is we enter into uh, the church, and we become Christians, or we think we are, and yet we continue to seek this self-righteous self-justification. We all do it. You may boast in your position. Think about it. You may boast in your, can I say it, your skin color. You may boast in your abilities. You may boast in your possessions. You may boast in... Uh, in your family. I don't know. You boast in the things, things you have. You may boast. Here's what happens for a lot of us. You may boast in the fact you're a good Christian. Now, you know, you're not perfect, but you may boast in, how about this? You may boast in being right. And friends, listen, if your boast or your desire to be right is greater than your desire to be loving, then your rightness has become your boast. And that's entered into self-righteousness. And pride. And a lot of believers are sending that message to the world. If your desire to be right is greater than your desire to be loving, you've gotten off track. Now, there's grace and truth. But where is your boasting? Justification by faith in Christ throws boasting away. It's not unlike a 16-year-old just got their license, come driving up to a friend's house, check out my new car. Friends are like, you didn't buy that car. You can't boast. That's not, your dad gave you that car, if that was the case. Or it's like me taking a picture with, the, with Maverick's NBA championship trophy. It seems like so long ago. Um, but uh, taking the picture, you know, like, hey, you know. And it's like, Jeff, you, you didn't win that trophy. You're not even on the team. Yeah, but look at me. Hey. Somebody else won that trophy. Are you kidding me? You can't boast in that. Listen, friends, Christ won the victory on our behalf. We did nothing. We weren't on his team. And he won for us. And now he's won our salvation. He obtained the victory. Our boast is in him. And this is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. In him alone. This is why I'll close with this. No faith, there is no faith apart from Christ. Because it's not even your faith. Listen to this. It's the object of your faith. You say, well, how much faith is enough? I have this conversation with people all the time. Had it this week with a young man who's going, how do you know? How do you know? Like, can, how do you know if you've done enough? Or how do you know if you believe enough? Like, is God, I might even get there before God and then all of a sudden this great cosmic trick. Right? Nope, you missed it. You didn't have enough faith. 
Or you didn't do enough. How can you know? You see, there's no, no faith apart from Christ. Because look at what it says here. He says, we are justified, in verse 24, by his grace as a gift. What is this justified? Now, you've been tracking with me here. You probably understand this. To, to declare a person to be righteous, right? To be right or just, to be okay. It's a legal term. It was signifying acquittal, made right, vindicated. It's pronounced as innocent. Not only did Christ take our, our, our sins upon the cross, but listen, he lived the perfect life on our behalf. He was our substitute, so we are completely forgiven and now declared as righteous, perfect before God. It's the only way we can stand before him. Some of you have heard the phrase, um, you know, justified. You can define it this way. It's really pretty, pretty legit, by the way. Uh, it's just as if I'd never sinned. But I think even better in our context, it's just as if I'd always obeyed. Because Christ obeyed on my behalf. This is the gospel, friends. This is why we're taking time this month to really unpack what is it that we believe. And some of us, can I say it? Some of us are even sitting here thinking, oh man, Jeff, I thought you were going to give me like a sermon on, I mean, this, this is heady stuff, this theology. Um, I thought it was going to be like maybe how to have a better marriage, you know, how to raise my kids, how to work. And that's, there's lots in the Bible that we, we, we talk about that. Like how to, how to experience peace and joy. How to pray better. You see what you're doing there? What do I need to do? What can I bring to the table? This is why we must constantly get back to the gospel. Because all we do is born out of this. And our beliefs dictate our behavior. And everything we do. And it clearly dictates our, our motivation. Well, in verse 24, we see another great word. It's redemption. This means liberation through a payment or a price. It's to purchase back something that was lost. It's a payment. It's a ransom. We've been bought back by God, lost in bondage. Now he has been set free. It's why Paul would say, but now the righteousness has come to us apart from our works. This is such good news. Look at where this passage keeps going. We went through verse 24. Look at verse 25 and 26. Whom God, so Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. There's a, another crazy word we don't use often. This means, really ultimately, it means wrath satisfier. Payment for us. God's wrath satisfier by his blood to be received by faith. There it is again. This was to show his righteousness. Because in, the divine, in his divine forbearance, his patience, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness in the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God is the just judge and the one who justifies. Only in Christianity do you have this framework of God the just judge who takes off his royal robe, if you will, steps out of his place of judgment. He comes and he becomes then the, the satisfier, the justifier in Christ. He takes on our penalty that should have come to us. He dies on the cross for our sin. Friends, there is no process towards justification. This is the distinction between Catholic theology and Protestant theology. By the way, there's no congruous merit what happens is we, we make a distinction between a declaration of justification, which is salvation, and then sanctification to follow. The Catholic Church would teach they're one and the same. Justification and sanctification. Okay, you're saved by faith, but you must continue on with good works in order to be justified. Ultimately, you never know if you're saved or not. You never know because there's works added to faith. It's why Calvin would come along after the Council of Trent, which was an, kind of an anti-Reformation or a response to the Reformation, where they said in the Council of Trent, they said, if anyone believes, and it still, it still holds authority in the Catholic Church, if anyone believes that they're saved by faith alone, let them be anathema, eternally damned. Calvin comes back and says, okay, no, no, no. It's by faith alone that we're saved. But that saving faith never comes alone. It's always followed by works. 
in response to what Christ has done, but it's not a part of salvation. It's an expression of a heart that's been and is being transformed by the love of God. This is why in Romans 4, 4 and 5, it says this, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. Does that make sense? If you, do, if you work, then you get a wage. He says, And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. You getting your mind around this? This is such good news. Sola fide, faith alone, separates Christianity, again, from every, every other religion on the planet. And it separates the true gospel from every false gospel that would come along. The very gospel is at stake with this doctrine today. You can't believe the weight that I was feeling coming up here to speak to you today. Because I'm believing that some of us think that we've received Christ by faith. And we haven't. Because we continue to believe that somehow something we bring to the table is going to assure our salvation. Friends, I want to set you free from that. God wants to set you free. To live in freedom in response to what he's done. And let me be clear, there's confusion even in the church. What we need is a reformation of the doctrine of salvation. We really do. I talk to people all the time, again, who doubt their salvation because it's, uh, what do I do? What do I bring to it? And here's what we do. We say, well, believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. Believe what? Well, I believe that he was the son of God. That's not saving faith. But I believe that he was the son of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's not believing faith. I believe that he was the son of God who takes away the sin of the world and that he has taken away my sin because I've given my life to him. I have received the grace that he's extended to me through his perfect life lived for me and his death upon the cross. I've received that by faith. That's saving faith. And you can say it in a lot of different ways. How about this? We talk to our children and we say, well, have you asked Jesus into your heart? We say this to adults. Have you asked Jesus into your heart? I mean, think about that as a kid. That's like, what is this, magic? What is this? And this mythical, magical stuff. Now, if by that you mean I've asked Christ to forgive me of my sin. You see, to ask him into your heart, that says nothing about, says, doesn't say a lot about the gospel, doesn't say anything about the cross, doesn't say anything about repentance. Does it say anything about giving your life to him in response to what he's done for you? If it's ask him into your heart to forgive you because you know that apart from him, there is no salvation, that's saving faith. It's why we go to great lengths to talk with people who are making decisions and children in particular. We sit down and we say, okay, what, what do we really understand here? And, and parents, I'm not trying to you know, make it difficult for you or shame you in any way. I'm trying to help you. You can help your children understand the gospel. I know as parents, we just don't want to get it wrong. You know, Paul prayed. He said that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. He prayed that in the book of Ephesians. And we see in, in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door and comes in with me, I'll dine with him and he with me. And there's a couple of things there. Again, it says nothing about the cross. And what Christ has done, it says everything about what we have to do in order to get in there. And he's also talking to believers. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking about an intimacy of relationship that comes with him. Now, again, if you're saying open the door of your heart, by faith, receive the gift that he has for you, because he's done all that's necessary, you bring nothing to the table. It is a free gift. You die to yourself, which means you die to your own self-justification, your own boasting, whatever that is, and you receive him, his grace by faith. That is saving faith. So it's faith apart from the commandments. Praise be to God. It's faith apart from culture. It's faith apart from concession. And it's no faith apart from Christ because he is the object of our faith. Have you been saved by grace through faith? in Christ.
Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.